OK, so thanks, everyone, for sticking around to the last talk of the day. Um, so I'm going to talk about a really very elegant and sort of like kind of central algorithm in differential privacy called private multiplicative weights. Um, so this is a, an algorithm that sort of solves the same problem that s the small db algorithm solves. So it's an algorithm for releasing kind of exponentially many statistical queries or linear queries, whichever you want to call it. Uh, it was originally from a, a very nice paper of Hart and Rothblum in 2010, although the presentation that uh, I'm going to give is sort of uh, compiled from a number of papers, including uh, one of mine and, and one of Katrina's. Um, and so this algorithm, even though it, it solves kind of the same problem qualitatively as the small db algorithm, has a number of kind of really nice features. So the ones that I think are maybe going to come through most like explicitly are that it's going to give sort of better and in fact kind of optimal accuracy for answering kind of a, like a worst case family of statistical queries. Um, it's also going to be sort of more computationally efficient. So the small db algorithm was sort of like laughably computationally inefficient. This is going to be sort of like Mo like computationally inefficient, but in a sort of less funny way, I guess. Um, so <laughs> you can implement it. Yes, in fact, it's been implemented in this paper, Hart, Liggett, and McSherry 13. This algorithm has been implemented and does, in fact, work for inputs of size up to like four or five. <laughs> um, <laughs> so on a log scale. Uh, so. And then the, the most sort of, you know, qualitatively kind of exciting thing about this algorithm is that uh, it extends very naturally, although some of the subtleties, like, I'm not going to get to, to the case of online statistical queries. So unlike smalldb, where, you know, you, you fix a big set of queries of interest up front and you try to generate kind of all at once a synthetic data set that preserves the answers to all of those queries, this is going to give us a way of answering queries that are kind of arriving online. So I, I can't know up front how to coordinate my answers to all the queries, and yet somehow I can still answer them with, uh, with very, very good accuracy. Um, and, and so and then also, like, technically, this algorithm is sort of a, like, a very like, elegant application of what I would say like, unequivocally is my favorite algorithm in the world, which is multiplicative weights. So if you take sort of one thing from this talk, actually, I hope it is multiplicative weights. Uh, it, is, it is quite cool. So let's begin. So let's start by just going over this thing that, that, that is called the multiplicative weights update rule. And let's sort of talk about like, what problem it solves and how amazingly well it solves it. So sort of a, you know, there are many like, stories for what this algorithm does. One kind of canonical type of story would be that you know you you are earning like one dollar a day. Sorry for my like slightly like geographically insensitive example here, uh, and you need to hire a financier to manage it. But of course you don't know who is like a good you know investment manager, so you have to choose from like these four somewhat hard to differentiate investment managers and decide like how to best invest your money for good returns. So you know like the first day you take your dollar. And you decide, like, I don't know who's very good, so I'll, I'll just invest it evenly. I'll put 25 cents in each. Adam's looking at me with great interest. I guess he has some, like, money problems. So you spread your money out evenly, and then, you know, at the end of the day, they tell you how much of it they lost. So, you know, like, this guy, like, he had a rough day. He lost 80% of your money. This guy lost 60%. This guy actually did pretty well. Like, he's sort of jumping for joy. He only lost 10% of your money. And so, you know, overall, out of your initial dollar, you lost 47 and a half cents. Okay, so, like, that wasn't so good. You lost 47 and a half cents out of a dollar. But, you know, you, you learn from your failures. So the next day, you decide to kind of readjust your portfolio. So. You say, like, this guy was terrible. I'm only going to, like, invest 10 cents with him. This guy did pretty good. I'll invest 50 cents. And now, like, you, you know, these guys, like, they, they invest your money. And today, the results are, like, very different. So, you know, this guy who did great yesterday now lost 80% of your money. This guy who was terrible yesterday now only lost 10%. 
So today, like, you did even worse. You lost 53 cents. And, you know, so on and so forth. Like, on day three, you rebalance, you see what you lost. On day four, you rebalance, you see what you lost. And obviously, your goal is to try, like, not to lose too much money. Like, your goal is to try to do about as well as you can. I'm, of course, being a little pessimistic since I'm only, like, thinking about lost money. Of, of course, you know, you can add in, like, the risk-free interest rate or something. And, uh, maybe you make some money. Okay, so more generally, you can imagine that there are some set of M financial advisors. And we're going to play this game for capital T days. On each day T, you're going to choose a probability distribution PT over the M experts. Every day, you're going to get losses. One for e you know, each, each uh, possible manager is going to lose some amount of money between 0 and 1. Uh, and what you're going to get, you know, the amount you lose is going to turn out to be the inner product of this vector P with this loss vector L. Okay, that's just a way of writing like what frac, you know, how much money you lost on day T out of your dollar. It's a number between 0 and 1. So we play this game for capital T days, you have M actions. And when it's all said and done, this is what you lost. You lost the sum from little t equals 1 to big T of the inner product of your distribution on day t with the loss vector on day t. All right? So, OK, like you lost some money. Like, did you do well or not? Well, like, suppose you had just kept things simple. Like, instead of all this rebalancing, you just, like, picked someone. Like, you picked manager I, and you just like stuck with manager I. Like instead of jumping around and sort of always picking the guy who did really well yesterday, you know, you just like kept it simple and picked I. Well then, you would have lost, you know, the sum of t from one to little, little t from one to big T of the loss of player I. And, you know, if you picked well, you would lose the min over I of this quantity. Like, if you had just known, like, okay, look, there's this one guy, he's pretty good, I should have just stuck with him, that's what you would have lost. And so this quantity that people study is called regret. The, the thing you're trying to, to ensure is that you don't regret the strategy you played in the sense that, in hindsight, you don't just, like, wish you had put all your money with I every day. Okay, so this quantity, regret, is defined as the amount you lost minus the minimum over all i of the amount you would have lost if you just played like i over and over again, like you just put all your money with i. Okay, and you can sort of think of this as just like how dumb do I feel for not sticking with i the whole time. Okay? So this is not in any sense like the best you could have done, right? Like the best you could have done would have been to pick a different person each day who had the lowest loss. But that's sort of like too clairvoyant, like, you know, you can't feel silly for not getting that, but you might feel silly, like, why didn't I just recognize that this person was the best and put all my money with them? Okay, so this is the model. You want to try to find an algorithm, a way for choosing these investments that minimizes regret. Okay, is the problem somewhat clear? All right, so, it, you know, this might sound like a little magical, like how could you hope to do this? You don't know the losses. And yet, very surprisingly, there's this elegant algorithm called the multiplicative weights update rule that guarantees that no matter what the losses are, so for any sequence of losses, the losses can even be sort of chosen in an adaptive fashion based on what you play day to day. The amount you lose is this funny quantity, which is about square root of t times log of the number of experts. Okay, so let's sort of, you know, parse that for a second. Like, the losses are somewhere between 0 and 1. So kind of the most you could have lost is t. Like, you could lose $1 every day. That's like the worst you could possibly do. And this says that compared to picking some particular person i in hindsight, the additional amount you lose is only a little bit bigger than the square root of t. So as the game goes on, your kind of average loss over all t days uh, is converging to 
the loss of the best expert you could have picked. All right, and another thing that's kind of like important is that it has this logarithmic dependence on the number of actions. So it has a very, the regret only grows sort of very slowly as the number of actions you can consider uh, goes to infinity. So that's gonna be like very important for us. There are like different algorithms that have sort of different parameters, but what's really sort of important is that this has a very mild dependence on the number of experts. Okay. So let's see what the algorithm actually does. So the algorithm is as follows. I'm just gonna put it up and then we can sort of like parse what it's doing for a second. So that's kind of the idea. The idea is that I'm gonna start with a uniform distribution, and right? I'm gonna start by putting an even share of my money, one over M, in every action. And you know, maybe sort of unsurprisingly, what I want to do is, you know, every day when after after a yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. That's a, so it's a parameter. We'll sort of talk about the, where the parameter comes from. Wait, so it, it is, I mean, it is related. It is not, it is meant to be smaller than one. It is, it is related to this parameter, but they're not supposed to be the same thing. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, maybe in the handout I did the average. I think I switched to doing the sum. Okay, but, but no, so th this is correct because it's the sum, like it ranges from zero to t. This is supposed to be a small parameter, but the, the actual parameter like will sort of, it, its meaning will sort of fall out, like the right way to set it will fall out of the analysis. So let's just hold tight on that. So the, the key idea, right, is that as you're going, you want to kind of put m like less of your money with the managers who are losing your money, right? Like if people keep losing your money, you should stop investing. But the thing you don't want to do is you don't want to kind of like overreact, right? You don't want to have a situation where, you know, on even number days, this guy loses a lot of my money, and so I give up on him, but then on odd days, you know, he does very well. Like you want to sort of stay calm. Like you want to, to kind of react slowly to what's happening. So the idea and it's expressed in a slightly funny way, which sort of is more to make the analysis clean, is I'm gonna keep track of a weight on each person. And then the way I'm going to distribute my money each day is I'm going to normalize the weights so that they become a probability distribution. Okay? So you know, I could have written this as a probability distribution, but somehow the analysis, it's much easier if you think of it as like these weights. So I'm gonna start with sort of even weights, weight one on everyone. And then I'm going to divide by the sum of the weights, which initially is M. And now, you know, I play that probability distribution and I find out what I lost. Okay, someone tells me what I lost. And now what I want to do is I want to sort of take weight off the actions that lost a lot. I want to shift my weight in such a way that the actions that lost a lot lose weight and the actions that lost a little, sort of keep most of their weight. And what makes this the multiplicative weights update rule is that when I decrease the weight of each action, I'm going to do it sort of proportional to this funny parameter e to the minus eta times the loss. And a good thing to just keep in mind is that you know, e to the minus eta times the loss is roughly equal one minus eta times the loss. Okay, so basically I reduce their weight by a fraction that is sort of proportional to the amount they lost, and this parameter eta is sort of what kind of trades off how quickly I react with how kind of like stable I am to, the, to, to what happens on a, a given day. Okay, so I notice I only decrease the weights but because I renormalize, what effectively happens is that the actions that lost a lot, their weight goes down a lot, so their probability goes down, whereas the actions that lost a little, their weight does go down, but only a little bit, so after I normalize, their probability will go up. Okay, so it has kind of the intuitive behavior you would, you would think. 
right? Um, Right? And like I said, eta is just a parameter that kind of balances kind of two things, and then we'll see sort of later like why it is that way. How am I doing on time? Good. Okay, so let's see like how to analyze this. Now like I wrote a lot of math, but I want to just sort of have it. I'm gonna do one of these on the board and then and then we'll like uh, and, and then I'll, I'll go through it slowly. So the key idea to the analysis is to use the sum of the weights as kind of a potential function. Okay, so the sum of the weights is this nice function where we know where it starts. We know it starts at m, because everything gets one. We know it never goes below zero, and we can say things about sort of like how the weight develops over time. So the first key fact is the simple one, that the weight starts at m, right? And now what we want to do is we want to kind of sandwich the weight in between two quantities. We want to sandwich the weight at the end of the process between two quantities. So the first is we want a lower bound on the weight in terms of how much some specific action I would have lost. Okay, and notice that right, every day I decrease the weight of action I by this quantity e to the minus eta times its loss. And so over all big T many days, right, I keep multiplying by this, so it adds in the exponent, so at the end of the process, the weight of person i is going to be e to the minus eta times the sum of their losses. All right, and since the weights never go negative, that's a lower bound on the sum of the weights. Right? Like the weight of any specific person is a lower bound on the sum of the weights over all the people. Okay, so that's the first claim. That's the easier half. Now, what we want to argue is that if we have invested, like if we have lost a lot of money, like if we received a lot of loss on a given day, then the total weight, the sum of all the weights, goes down a lot. Okay, so that's what this third bullet says. It says that the weight goes down sort of proportional to the total amount we lost. So, sort of debating how I should try to prove that. Let me see, one slide ahead. So the way to prove this, I'm going to do this on the board, is, and by the way, it should be in the slide printout, actually. So the way to do this is to look at the weight on day little t plus 1, which is equal to the sum over i. Is this big enough or should I write a little bigger? The sum over i of e to the minus eta times the loss of i on day t times the weight on day t of player i. Yeah, this is just the definition of the sum of the weights on day t plus 1. And what we want to do is we want to show that it is significantly smaller than the sum of the weights on day t. And we want to relate it to the sum of the weights on day t. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply, we're going to convert from exponential to something linear. So we're going to use the fact that we can upper bound this exponential by 1 minus the value of the exponential plus the value in the exponential squared. So this is just like the second order Taylor approximation. You're probably used to getting a lower bound using the first order Taylor approximation. You know, you kind of just want to trust me on this, I guess. So what is this quantity? Well, if we look at this first term, this is just the sum of the weights on day t. Okay, now the second term, I can just bound by eta 
squared, because the losses are between 0 and 1. So the only place to actually use the fact that the losses are between 0 and 1. So this becomes eta squared times the sum of the weights on day t. Now the last term is the tricky one. I want to write it as minus sum of the weights on day t times the sum over i of the loss times the probability of playing i on day t. So all I'm doing, this is the weight, and I'm sort of factoring out the normalizing factor and replacing this with the probability. Okay? And now this is 1 plus eta squared minus eta times the inner product of p and l times the sum of the weights. Okay, now I get to apply my Taylor approximation Okay, this is the whole lemma. So this is, you know, I know it's like a little symbol pushing, but like it's the, you know, the sort of thing that I'm sure all of you can, can do. But right, the key is that what I've shown is that every day the total weight decreases kind of proportional to e to the minus eta times what I lost. Right, and now I'm just going to take the product over all t days and use the fact that the sum of the weight starts at m and I get that third bullet point. Okay, and now I'm going to leave as an exercise for the reader. I have a lower bound and an upper bound on the weights. On day t, I'm going to leave it as sort of an exercise for the reader slash audience to verify that after doing some algebra, like taking logs, rearranging, you get the statement that the amount you lost over all t days minus the amount person I lost over all t days is at most this like two-termed expression where one term is eta times t, so something like hopefully very small times t, and the other term is log of the number of actions over eta. So that's going to become, or if I balance these two terms, I'm going to get what I claimed. I'm going to get about 2 root t log, log m. Okay, so this is like, in my opinion, very cool theorem, a cool analysis. I know it's like, a little late in the day for this kind of uh, this kind of thing, but like it's it's once you sort of internalize the idea of how you of how you analyze it, it's really like not not so forbidding. So well, now let's just go back to the statement. So if you whether or not you believe the proof, the theorem is that we have this algorithm for how you adjust the weights on a given day. And it kind of has this magic ability to sort of adjust to which actions are doing well without kind of overcorrecting and getting fooled. And so it ensures that the regret over t days is at most about square root t times log of the number of actions. Kind of no matter what losses someone gives me. That's like the cool thing about the theorem. Now I want to make one, one more. I want to put this in like a slightly more useful form for what we're going to do next. I just want to do the following. So notice like what I've done here is I've said instead of considering the minimum over all individual actions, I'm considering the minimum over all distributions over actions. That sounds like I'm asking for a stronger theorem because I'm asking to have low, I'm asking to sort of be close to a space with like more options in hindsight. However, like the minimum overall distributions is always attained at like a single action. So this actually is no stronger, but it's going to be like more useful for what we want to do. So what I want to say is that you choose a bunch of p's, one for each day, and the amount you lose is not too much bigger than what you would have lost if you played some fixed distribution. Okay. Good. So this is like, you know, a whole subject on its own. You can take like a whole class on like no regret learning. We could have a whole week of stuff about, uh, about online learning and no regret learning. But here's a little taste of it that's just like what we're going to use for privacy. 
Okay, so so far we, we like we ditched privacy for a while. Let's go back to private multiplicative weights and let's see like how to use this to get an actual algorithm. So I'm going to start by giving you sort of like a a non-private algorithm for answering a bunch of queries. I know that sounds like I'm not doing anything, but I'm going to sort of write it down in a way that like will be sort of privacy friendly. And so to do this, I want to like be sort of clear about like how like, like a lot of this is kind of how you think about a data set. And in particular, I want to think about a data set in as sort of a probability distribution. So like Katrina talked at great length about data sets as histograms, where for every possible record in the database, I say how many people have that record. So if you just divide by the number of people in the database, what you got was a probability vector, like a probability distribution over all the possible records. So I'm going to think about the data set as a probability distribution. And the reason this is nice is because even though my data set is a sort of discrete probability distribution, it's like uniform over n people, it now kind of makes sense to talk about data sets that are just arbitrary probability distributions. You know, looking ahead, that sort of sounds kind of close to what we talked about with multiplicative weights. Okay, so like the first idea is like think of data sets as probability distributions. Now, like why do I want to do this? So if I think of my data set X as a probability distribution P star, that's like the good probability distribution, that's my data set, then what we want to do is we want to answer these linear queries over P star. So a query is like a vector Q with entries in 0, 1, and the query is just the inner product of Q with P star. Okay, and that happens to also be, I mean, that's sort of, sort of the way Katrina defined linear queries, but it also happens to be sort of equivalent to these statistical queries that I like to harp on. But really it doesn't matter. Just think of the queries as a bunch of linear functions on P star. Okay, and now the error of the queries, like if I, like we want to find some p hat, like some other private probability distribution p hat. And we want it to be like close to p star with respect to all the queries. So we want to find p hat such that the maximum over all queries in our family of the difference between q dot p hat and q dot p star is small, like smaller than some alpha. Now I've done like one more trick, which is that normally you'd want to bound the absolute value of this quantity, right? Normally I would, I would want my queries not only to have answers that are not too much higher than the true answer, but not too much lower than the true answer. I claim that it's sort of without loss of generality to bound one side. Can anyone like say how I could uh, reduce to the case where I only have this one-sided accuracy guarantee? Yeah, just double Q, right? Just like include Q and minus Q in the in the set of queries, and uh, uh, that'll that'll ensure that you're both not too high and not too low. Okay, so we're gonna think about these objects like data sets or distributions over all possible records. Q is like a zero one vector over uh, all possible records, and I want the inner product. So good, we're getting there. We're working towards it. All right, so now I want to use multiplicative weights somehow to like learn p star. All right, so I want to use multiplicative weights. So multiplicative weights kind of naturally starts to give us some approximation to p star, just a really bad one. Like it starts with this uniform distribution. So let's say, you know, someone tells us like, I got a good approximation to p star. It's this guy. And you say, eh, I don't think so, man. That doesn't sound right. And you you know, you, he says, prove it, and you say, okay, here's a query whose answer on p star is very low, like p star doesn't put a lot of mass on these points, but whose answer on p1 is like significantly higher. p1 puts a lot more mass on those points. And you say, all right, fine, you win. p1 was not a good approximation. Wait, ah! <laughs> Let me try again. Let me use Q as the loss vector for multiplicative weights, and let me come up with a better distribution. Okay, so notice like I've dropped out the actual form of multiplicative weights here, like it just clutters up the slide. 
So I'm not like writing like what is multiplicative weights, but what you're really doing is you're keeping track of these Ws, you're doing these adjustments, you're normalizing, but I'm just like consolidating this into like a function because I don't like we don't actually care about like why it works anymore. Okay, so like I started out with this bad approximation. Someone found a query that proves that this is a bad approximation, and I use this multiplicative weights algorithm to kind of adjust P2 so that at least with respect to this query, it looks more like the real data set. Okay? So that's kind of the whole dance. Like you start with some bad approximation to the data set, like uniform. Now you tell someone, okay, find me like the query that I'm doing the worst on. Like tell me this query QT that like my approximation is most terrible for. And now I will use Q to kind of bring PT plus one closer to the database using this multiplicative weights algorithm. And then when it's all said and done, like I'm gonna run this for some number of rounds, capital T. So far there's like no privacy, so like I might as well run it for like infinitely many rounds, but obviously that's not what we're gonna do. But when we decide we're done, we're gonna output some P hat. And P hat is just gonna be the average of everything we've chosen so far. Yeah, so like we have these approximations, hopefully most of them are like pretty good, they're starting to get closer and closer to the data set, so we'll output the average of all of them, and I claim that that p hat is going to be very close to the data set, at least with respect to all these queries. We are in fact going to take the average, you can also do the last, but somehow like, you know, you can save a line or two of the analysis if you just do the average. It's a little counterintuitive, right? Because you'd think like the later ones are better. Somehow that's like not important in the way you actually analyze it. Okay, so this is a non-private algorithm. Like, we're really taking our time here. We just have a convoluted non-private algorithm for approximating P star. But let's at least prove that this is a good approximation to P star. So I claim that basically as I run this algorithm for more rounds, the error of p hat goes down. And it goes down as square root of the log of the domain over t. Right? And this is going to just be a consequence of the regret bound we proved. It's going to be like a totally like we only use the fact that multiplicative weights has low regret. We don't care like why it works. It's just sort of a black box. So let's do the analysis, like one line at a time. So what is the error of p hat? So it's the max over all queries of that query vector dot p hat minus p star. Right? That's just the definition of the error. And the definition of p hat is that it's the average over all t of pt, our approximation in round t. Now, the max of the sum is at most the sum of the max. Right? I would get even more error if I were allowed to choose a different query q for each day t. So I'm going to upper bound this by the average over all t of the maximum over all queries q of q dot pt minus p star. So this is sort of the worst that I'm doing on a given day pt. Now, I chose qt to be exactly the q that maximizes this term. Okay, so this just says one over, this is just the average over all days of qt dot pt minus p star. And that is exactly the regret of my algorithm. That is like the exact definition of regret, right? I view the losses as QT, and now I ask, well, how much did my choices lose versus the optimal choice, P star? So our theorem about the regret says that this quantity is at most one over T times the regret of multiplicative weights, which gives this quantity, two times square root log of the universe over the number of days. So I'm converging towards having like p star exactly. Right? And we can do that because we're not private yet. Like I, you know, if I wanted to, I can run this forever and I can get p star exactly. Obviously privately I can't do that. So 
let's at long last like try to figure out how to make this private. And like the key observation for how to make this private is that we actually only look at p star in one place. Like there's only one step of this algorithm where we need to know p star. And that is when we find the like the worst query qt. Right? That's like the only place where we actually look at the data set. So using this really elegant like post-processing and composition stuff, right? This is where we're really going to use this idea that differential privacy is programmable. We're just going to make this step private, and then we're done. Like we're just going to like the whole algorithm is going to be private, at least if we set the parameters correctly. So all I need to do is I need to find the query QT that maximizes this quantity, or at least approximately maximizes this quantity. How can I do that? You have it on the notes, but you know, try to do it from memory. Like if someone says, design me a private algorithm for like choosing the best object from a set of objects, what algorithms do you know that are good for that? Find noisy max and or the exponential mechanism. Those are both correct answers. For these purposes, it doesn't really matter what you use, although I've written the slides, uh, I've written the slides with the exponential mechanism, but both work. Okay, so you know, you actually saw this morning like a whole kind of talk about the exponential mechanism, so I don't want to go into the details like too much. But just to sort of refresh your memory, what we're going to do is we're going to choose a query QT in the set of queries Q that we're interested in with probability sort of exponentially weighted towards this error quantity Q dot PT minus P star. And this is a sensitivity one over N quantity. So because P is kind of normalized, if I change one point in P star, I only change the distribution in statistical distance by one over N. So this, this quantity will only change by 1 over n, so I have this factor of n in here. Okay, and the properties of the exponential mechanism that you want to recall, and again, something similar would happen if we did report noisy max, is that so this algorithm satisfies epsilon 0, 0 differential privacy. So since I'm going to want to compose this algorithm t many times, and I want to get like the best possible bounds, I'm going to use the advanced composition theorem that Kobe talked about. And if you recall, or if you're willing to believe me, if what I want in the end is epsilon delta privacy, then every day I should run the exponential mechanism with privacy parameter epsilon over about square root t. Okay? And if I wanted the sort of basic composition theorem, I would set it to epsilon over t. And then I'll get a slightly worse bound. But the tightest bound you can get is by setting epsilon to be or epsilon zero to be about epsilon over root t. So that's our privacy. Like this is a private algorithm, and in fact we can compose it and make the whole algorithm private. So as always, the next thing we need is some statement about the accuracy of the exponential mechanism. And the key property of the exponential mechanism is that it finds a value, in this case a query, that is kind of optimal, so it its value kind of approaches this maximum value minus this approximation, which is logarithmic in the number of choices, so log of Q, over epsilon 0 N. Okay, so the, the kind of key to getting like good performance with this algorithm is that we can find this query with error log of the number of queries. Right? If you didn't use the exponential mechanism, if you did something like add noise to all the queries in this step, you would pay polynomially in the number of queries. So of course you wouldn't want to do that. Okay, so up to this error, we actually find the query, like we find the largest query. So now if we just, instead of choosing the argmax, we choose this kind of approximation to the argmax using the exponential mechanism. We've made the whole algorithm private. Like, privacy is done. Like, we apply post-processing, we apply composition, and we're done. And I claim that this only increases the error that we, uh, that we, uh, that we incur 
by this factor, which is sort of the error of the exponential mechanism on each day. I mean, it kind of makes sense. Like we're not going to be able to get down to like zero error the way we were before, because right, if no query has large error, then the exponential mechanism is just going to sort of return nonsense. And so we're not going to be able to get accuracy below the error of the exponential mechanism. Okay, but why do we get this error? Well, if you just go through the calculation again, the only thing that changes is that on each day, QT is not the thing that maximizes this quantity. However, it is within alpha zero of maximizing that quantity. Okay, so every day we just sort of pay this factor of alpha zero and it averages out over all the days. And so in the end, we get this regret bound plus alpha zero. Okay, so we just need to be slightly more careful to keep track of how the error in the argmax and the sort of private argmax step affects the overall accuracy of the algorithm. Okay, good. So up to some substitution of parameters in algebra, we're kind of done, right? So we took this algorithm, we made the whole thing private just by using the exponential mechanism in the one step where we need the data set, the original database. We modified our accuracy analysis, and it says that if we run it for t steps, we get this error. So it's kind of a complete theorem, but of course we want to put it all in terms of like the natural parameters of the problem, not these funny like t's and epsilon zeros. So remember by composition, if I'm going to run this algorithm for t rounds, I need to set the privacy parameter in each round to about epsilon over square root t if I want to get privacy for the whole thing. So let's just like sub that in to our claim. We had the claim in terms of epsilon zero, now we have it in terms of epsilon. And now what happens is we have one term that is getting better as t gets bigger. Like as t gets bigger, we're getting more convergence to the true data set. But as t gets bigger, we also have to add more noise to ensure privacy. Okay, and now, you know, you just pick the parameters to optimize uh, the sum, there's some, you know, t that minimizes the sum of those two terms. And if you trust me to do algebra, here's what you get. You get that the final error is proportional to log of the number of queries, square root log of the domain size, square root log 1 over delta, all over epsilon n, and all taken to the 1 half. Okay, so like, is that good or bad? Small db gives you basically the same result, except these square roots are just replaced with a log of the universe, and this one half is replaced with a one third. Okay, so quantitate like we've improved quantitatively, arguably by a lot, potentially by little, depending on your perspective. But you know, we did a lot of this work just to like improve like quantitatively the error we can get. However, this turns out to be essentially optimal. So I don't know if we'll see like a full proof of that, but like this turns out to be the best bound you can get if you say, you know, I want to answer an arbitrary set of linear queries on a data set uh, over x of size n. This is like the best bound you can get. So let's also talk about running time. So this algorithm is sort of simple in a sense, and it's sort of efficient in a sense, which is that basically in every round what I need to do is I need to maintain this big vector PT, which is a probability distribution over the domain. Okay? And then to run the exponential mechanism, I need to take the inner product of PT with like every query vector Q. So that means every round what I have to do is I have to do kind of a uh, size of Q times size of X computation. And size of X can be huge, right? Like if my data set is, you know, 100 bits per person, then the size of X is 2 to the 100. But at this level of generality, like we're not saying kind of anything nice about the queries or the data set. Like as far as you know, the queries are just specified by like a gigantic truth table. Like they're just given as vectors. So this algorithm is sort of linear in this form of input. Like if I specify the queries just as a, as a matrix, this algorithm is sort of linear time in that matrix. 
it's of course not how you like would normally want to like think of the queries. You normally want to think of them as like polynomial time functions on the data set. But there is a sense in which this is kind of like the best possible running time if you sort of specify the input in this like non-compact representation. And also as we'll see tomorrow, this is the best running time you can get in the worst case under certain cryptographic assumptions. So this is, uh, at least at this level of generality, this is kind of the most efficient possible. Okay, so good. So we saw that the algorithm, we talked about sort of why it improves qual uh, quantitatively in terms of running time and accuracy over small db. What I want to do in the last uh, like 10 minutes I have, I think, is to just to sort of give like sort of a, like a, a sense of how you turn this into an online algorithm. So, so far we've been talking about this as an offline algorithm, which, you know, small db was also a perfectly good offline algorithm. But at least sort of intuitively, this algorithm might like look to you like it would, it could be extended to the online case in a way that small db can't. Like small db is this kind of one shot computation that involves all queries kind of all at once. This algorithm is sort of this iterative procedure. Like I'm kind of using one query at a time to improve my approximation. So at least you might think that kind of as the queries come in over time, I don't need to know like all the queries I'll ever see. Somehow as queries come in, I can get a finer and finer approximation and maybe at some point um, I will have a good enough approximation and I can just use that for the sort of whole remainder of the computation and not lose any more privacy. So, okay, so first let's just say exactly what I mean when I talk about an online algorithm. So the model is kind of this, you have your data set. You have some algorithm that has the data set, but instead of outputting something, some function of the data set, it sticks around. And kind of every day someone gets to ask you a query, the same type of query, like a linear query. But now I have to give it an answer like before I've seen the next query. And this is going to go on for k rounds. And the k queries can even be like adaptively chosen. So, you know, the second query can be based on my answer to the first query and so on and so forth. And of course, what I want is to answer that, you know, all the answers I give are within alpha of the true answer. So, let me just state, like you'll have it in your slides, the online algorithm. And let me just give like a sketch of what this online algorithm is doing. So it uses the same idea of kind of iteratively improving the data set using multiplicative weights. But it does the following. So instead of finding, instead of going out and like searching for the bad query that you need to improve your data set, you like wait for the bad query to come to you. So what you do, same thing, you start with the uniform distribution over the domain, that's your data set. And now, Basically what you do is you let queries come in and when a query comes in, you basically ask, which of two cases am I in? Either my, my, my approximation PT is already good at answering that query, right? PT is close to the real data set P star with respect to that query. And if it is, I don't even look at the data set anymore. I just output the answer on that, on that approximation PT. Otherwise, if PT is not good, then it's like, it's a bad query. Like it's the query I used to go out and look for, but now I've one, one has found me. So what I do is I answer that query, possibly with additional noise to achieve privacy, and then I do an update. Okay, so once someone, once someone brings me a query for which my current approximation does a bad job, I use that query that someone has brought me to do the multiplicative weights update. Okay, so unlike the offline case where I went and found these queries, like now, you know, sometimes they come to me and sometimes they don't. And the sort of key claim, which follows in basically the exact same way as what we did for the offline case, is that no matter how many queries someone brings to me, if I have some given accuracy alpha in mind, there can only be log of the domain over alpha squared bad queries. So no matter how many queries you bring me, only this relatively small number of them will actually be bad queries. And if I've already answered that many bad queries, 
it must be the case that my data set is now close, like my, my approximation PT is now close to the real data set. And so from now on, like I'm never gonna use the real data set. I'm just gonna keep answering you with this thing that I've, that I've already got. So of course, to make this private, we need some way of doing this test, right? Someone brings us this query and we have to decide, is this query like a, a bad query or is it not a bad query? And um, the naive way to do that would be to add noise to this test every time. But now like we're not making any progress. We're just answering all the queries with independent noise and so we're not doing anything smart. And the key idea is to use this sparse vector or above threshold algorithm that Katrina just presented as a way of finding the queries with large error. So kind of formalizing this exactly as an instance of, of uh, above threshold takes a little bit of work. But the idea is that the queries I'm looking at are now of the form, how bad is my current approximation PT? And I'm going along and I'm waiting until someone finds a query that's way above my threshold alpha. And sparse vector basically gives me a way to do that without paying for this test at all k queries, roughly only paying for log of the number of queries. So, you know, here's sort of pseudocode for the whole algorithm, uh, you know, but the main idea is that the time between the updates is going to be one iteration of above threshold, and then I'm gonna use composition over all the updates and uh, this above threshold algorithm gives us the right way to kind of inject noise into the whole process. So you know, unfortunately due to time and, and sort of the difficulties of presenting these things in PowerPoint, going through the whole proof of the online case is a little tricky, but uh, what's sort of nice about this multiplicative weights framework is that it, it kind of smoothly generalizes to this online case, at least once you know this above threshold algorithm. So, that's kind of all I want to say. What I just sort of want to leave you with is this kind of master theorem for query release. This is kind of like the best result you can get in like many respects at once. So and if, what it says is that for any sequence of K online queries, this is sort of the harder of the two settings, there's an algorithm that runs in sort of linear time in the domain and the number of queries and answers all those queries with this error. And what we'll see in some future talks, or at least allude to, is that this running time is essentially optimal for arbitrary queries, and this error is essentially optimal for arbitrary queries. So in some sense, like, if you want to answer these sort of arbitrary linear queries, this is like the best theorem you can get. And so much of the work, some of which will come up in later talks, is sort of dealing with non-arbitrary queries, like nicely structured queries, where we can and often do much better than this. So for example, the threshold queries Kobe presented are an example where we can do better than this, both in running time and accuracy by using specific structure of the queries. But in some sense, we're at like the end of the road for like arbitrary queries. And so this is like a really good thing to know when you're kind of putting results in context. So thank you very much. That's all, that's all I have for today.